I hope you're having a, a very wonderful Monday afternoon. Uh, we're heading for a top of um, 31. And uh, the sun's shining brightly and the sky is nice and blue. And it brings us uh, to uh, the topic, our next topic, which, of course, is uh, the environment. And we hear a lot, don't we, about Adelaide's aspirations to become carbon neutral. But do we really understand what that means? What the heavens is carbon neutral? I'm not sure. So to find out, uh, we've got some very special guests in the studio. And let's start with uh, Julie, Julia Grant from uh, the Department of Environment, Water and Natural Resources. How are you? I'm well. Good afternoon, Alan. Uh, beautiful blue sky out there. It is. It's gorgeous. And that's what we want to see more of, and you're going to help make it happen. What is carbon, carbon neutral? What are we talking about here, Julia? Well, when we talk about a carbon neutral city, what we basically want to do is to make sure that our net greenhouse gas emissions are basically zero. And... Um, the commitment is between state government and the Premier and the Lord Mayor have joint forces to say, let's make um, Adelaide the world's first carbon neutral city. And what that means is, look, is basically all our greenhouse gas emissions that come from our transport, mm -hmm. um, basically the energy in our buildings and, and residential homes, basically to zero. So... Um, that requires things like energy efficiency, it requires um, low emission transport, changes the way we um, build our buildings and um, a whole raft of things. And also looking that we're not going to get down to zero by doing everything. We know that we will at some stage need to offset. Now offset means all those emissions that we're not going to get down to zero by having energy efficiency or renewable energy mm -hmm. or low emission transport, we're going to have to offset them in some way. And that basically means looking at different programs like um, growing growing forests or, or things like that. There's a whole raft of things that we can do. But what we want to see is that it's um, an investment within South Australia. So if we are dealing with energy efficiency, um, low carbon transport, we see these as economic opportunities as well for our city. And so that's the exciting thing. So what sort of time frame are we looking at? This is a, this is a long game, isn't it? We really want to be... So it's a long... Well, it's, it's a long game, but it's also short and medium-term action. So what that means... We're world's first, we're hoping um, by 2020, 2025, that we are going to um, achieve that goal. Now, that's what, an to be carbon neutral? To be carbon neutral. So that's a really ambitious goal. But Julia, it's 2017 already. That's right. So <laughs> that's why we need lots of people to join in because we know it's not something governments or businesses or, or community members can do by themselves. Mm. Basically, we have to join, join forces to achieve it. And we know that it's an ambitious goal because we know there's cities around the world like Copenhagen that are that are really, um, really very ambitious and, and along the along the track. But it's a great ambition because it's got great environmental outcomes, but really excellent economic opportunities and and things like innovative ways and technologies that we can look at and in investing in. Is it realistic though? Um, you know, in the big scheme of things, and 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 you know, global warming and so forth. And there's so many naysayers out there saying that doesn't even exist. God help us that people actually have that view. Uh, feel free to call in if you want. A double two three double o double o. We can have that discussion. Um, but uh, you know, go down to Piri Street, Brush Hour, for example. You can't move in the street. You can't hear yourself because of the amount of buses driving up and down the street, and you know, dragging off and, and you know, driving off and, and and pulling in and so forth. How, how are we going to achieve? such a target in such a short short time when we're reliant on uh, that sort of public transport well i i believe we're already beginning to see the change occur so um there's a commitment with the government to look at um, um electric buses um, solar buses um you know, looking at biodiesel trials and um similarly uh the minister for energy released a, um, a hydrogen roadmap and looking at um sort of the big vehicles in with hydrogen fuel cells so um and electric vehicles is is going to be the car of the future, I believe, and and solar solar powered vehicles. We've just had the World Solar mm -hmm. Challenge yep. in yep. in South Australia, and and really the the innovation and the work that's happening is quite quite amazing. So yes, it is a big change, but I believe that just like solar panels, when they started off being quite expensive, how they've come down so so far in pricing and that nearly one in three South Australians have got solar panels. So I think we will eventually see the same change 
happen. And yes, we've we've got a bit long way to go, but you look at so electrifying train lines, um, extending the tram, you look at the O-Barn extension, all these things are looking at promoting public transport, um, a low emission, um, low emission options for, for community members and um, so I, I think the, the future looks bright. And uh, I guess, you know, in a strange way, the, the closure of Holden at the end of this week does create a new opportunity, doesn't it, to go down that path of solar cars and electric, electric cars and so forth. In my personal view, probably more so than driverless cars, but certainly electric cars. Well, I think, well, you look at some of the Tesla cars, I mean, they, mm. um, uh, they, they're electric and they're autonomous too. So um, I, I honestly think that by the time I'm sort of, you know, heading into retirement, I think what people are driving on the roads are going to be significantly different from mm. now. Mm. And w- as we know, uh, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago with the Lord Mayor, there are recharging stations popping up all over Adelaide, you know, the, the central market and so forth yes. for electric cars. Yes, and and, there, and there's a few places um, plotted around in in some sort of uh, shopping shopping areas that will start seeing some um, recharging. So recharging, but also the price point of electric vehicles at the moment sort of feels out of reach for mm. most people. But like I mentioned before, I I think there'll be a big change. We we no longer need tariffs to protect our car industry anymore. So we want to see see some of those um, removed and. Um, uh, and the uptake increase. So, um, and it just makes sense because sometimes that capital outlay on a, a vehicle like that might seem quite high, but the fact that you're not going to be having um, to have repairs or, or um, you know, sort of uh, as frequently as we have with our cars we have now will be an investment which saves money in the future. And it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, we were the highest uptake, had the highest uptake of solar panels, as you said, in Australia. We still are, yeah. I, I, I believe. Yes, and um, Queensland, Queensland is still fairly high as well, but um, really South Australia is mm. one in three. And, and I think it goes to a lot of what South Australians do well um, you know, historically, like container deposit legislation, the banning of shopping bags, mm. um, a whole raft of things that South Australians just take up and just lead the way on mm. and don't think twice about it, but really they, they're trailblazing. So we've uh, identified this target and uh, we've put an action plan into place. Um, as a result, we have a number of partners, or you have a number, number of partners yes. uh, throughout uh, Adelaide. Do you want to tell us about those partnerships? So this is um, uh, the Carbon Neutral Adelaide Partnership Program. So we launched the program, um, uh, my minister, Minister Hunter in Hunter, the Minister for Climate Change and the Lord Mayor launched the program in May and um, we had 40 members at that point. We're now um, nearly 70 and we're hoping really to have a push on and to have some founding partners by the end of the year and um, we, we have um, a couple in the studio with mm-hmm. us here today, Hayley and Paul. Yep, we'll and, talk to um, you guys in a moment. Yeah. And, um, and really it's... Um, organisations that are like-minded who are thinking what's good for the environment but also what's good for their business because the younger generation and I've seen it even in my own house with a 17 year old, 15 year old and a 13 year old are already looking at their purchasing decisions and they're looking on sustainability Mm. um, things. So companies are looking at how they can um, position themselves well, do something for the environment save themselves money because they they have reduced utility bills by reduced um you know energy efficiency measures and um and basically it's actually a great place to position themselves because i believe it's the way of the future and it's the partners like paul and hayley that are getting uh, um, ahead of the curve and positioning their their um their organizations really well it's um the, the, it's a necessity of the future, isn't it? It's not just the way. I mean, at the, at the big picture, we have to go down this path. That's right. It's and as simple as that. And it, although it seems like it's not really a new thing, a lot of, a lot of your listeners would, um, um, either themselves or their parents or grandparents, were living, were living lives that were hugely energy efficient, water efficient, recycling, you know, reusing shopping bags and things like that. So mm. we're sort of coming full circle in a way. We're talking about Adelaide becoming carbon neutral. I uh, hope we've explained thus far where we're headed with that. Uh, we'll talk to uh, Paul and uh, Hayley just after this. Welcome back. It's 11 minutes away from 2 o'clock. We're talking about a carbon neutral uh, Adelaide uh, that uh, the target has been uh, has been laid down for us and uh, we're on our way trying to get there. And in the studio we have uh, Julia Grant from the Department of uh, Environment, Water and Natural Resources who uh, have been tasked with this, this minor challenge. It's all your responsibility? 
Yes. <laughs> and, um, well, it, it's everyone's responsibility, yeah. I suppose. And that was I, going to be my next line. It's not just you. That's right. We've so, all got to share the load, haven't we? We absolutely do. So um, uh, leading the way in, in just sort of maybe coordination efforts is, is really probably my role. But um, the City of Adelaide is a key partner. Mm. And we have, um, as I mentioned, 70 partners across the city that have all joined in to be partners and um, uh, looking to achieve um, the, the target. And one of those partners or two of those partners we have with us at the moment. Uh, we'll, we'll begin with uh, Paul Daly from uh, Sustainable Design Consultants, D Squared Consulting. How are you, Paul? Yeah, good, thanks. Sir. What does that mean, a consultancy? What are you? Uh, 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 yeah, so we, um, yeah, we, we just say everything's easy and provide <laughs> advice and get paid lots of money to do that. And uh, But, no, we... Um, we provide advice to state government agencies, to architects, to developers, building owners, as to how they could make their buildings and infrastructure have less of an impact on the environment. So zero carbon is a big part of an environmental mm-hmm. impact of a building. Um, we've previously developed zero carbon house, zero carbon challenge house at Lockhill Park, uh, zero carbon offices in Port Adelaide. Last year we uh, entered into the uh, Zero Carbon Entrepreneurs Challenge and secured a commendation for our Zero Carbon Apartments design. So uh, this is really you know, no-brainer territory for us. Yeah, t- t- just uh, let's pair it back. Uh, I want to build a, a Zero Carbon House. What does that mean? Yeah, so um, Zero Carbon House is actually really, really simple. You know, it's a, a sort of single or two-storey house, conventional house that uh, you might want to build on a, on a plot of land. Uh, the amount of energy that that house uses compared to its roof area is a really good match. So you can just put solar panels on the roof, uh, generate enough power for you to use, use your house to use during the day, export the balance, and the net impact over the year is a zero net carbon impact. It's actually really, really quite straightforward. If you if you happen to be quite wealthy and can afford batteries at the moment, mm-hmm. you can put a battery installation in and be truly uh, zero carbon uh, it becomes much more difficult and this is the challenge that i think uh, state government and uh, city council have got for adelaide much more difficult in an urban environment or a dense urban environment where buildings become taller spaces become more compact the roof area that you have isn't close to being enough to to put solar panels on the size of batteries that you might need really becomes unaffordable the space is an issue, so then it becomes a bigger infrastructure issue. So, but certainly at a housing level, it's, it's uh, it, uh, genuinely it's actually quite easy. Does it also dictate as to what uh, materials I use to build my house? Yeah, a little bit. Although even if you built uh, a house that was just basically deemed to satisfy building code compliance, so without any special features, you know, generally, you know, uh, is you know like a like a volume built home, like mm. a sort of spec home, one and a half to two kilowatts of solar panels on the roof would still cover it off so the zero carbon challenge house was a super low energy intensity as well so we put a lot of effort into the building fabric design materials etc but you don't when one of the learnings that came out of that project is you don't have to do that uh you know again as you get more dense it becomes more an issue but if i really wanted to uh go seriously down this path i could make allowances on what sort of materials that i used for example concrete not necessarily um, uh, carbon neutral as far as its production is concerned. So I'd find some more environmentally friendly materials? Absolutely. So you're taking the pressure off of your your solar system. If you're sort of, you know, being smart about the materials that you use, smart about the house design, maybe you can pull the solar panels down from two kilowatts to one and a half, maybe even one kilowatt if it was a super efficient home. So, yeah, you can sort of, you know, that would save you money. You've got some money available then to put into some of the materials. Yeah, if you if you uh, looked at the design of the home a little bit more carefully, mm. looked at shading, orientation, yep. all those things, which not every home builder does. You know, not everybody thinks about that. They just sort of are looking at the plot size, where the views are, where the, where the, where the kitchen's going to be. But if you think about the design of it, yeah, you can you can you can save yourself. I've got to say, one of my my, my biggest concerns, and probably one of my pet hates as well, uh, Julia might even want to chip in, back in on this, is all the new houses we're building these days. They don't have eaves. For goodness' sake, the the, the environment in which we live, building a house without eaves. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Don't you agree? I think there's a um I think there's a big move towards going back back to having those um sort of Remember the homestead? This typical Australian homestead had a veranda all around it. It was there for a reason. That's right, that's right. So I um I think people are beginning to 
honestly think about that, especially if if you want to reduce, you know, the size of your air conditioning or your heating costs and all those types yeah. of things. The design of the house, your installation, all those things, where where it's orientated, north facing or whatever, hmm. is um, really important. We've also got uh, Hayley uh, uh, Everest with us from Oz Harvest. Hi, Hayley. Good afternoon. I wouldn't have thought Oz Harvest being a, a food... Uh, well, how do you describe Oz Harvest? Well, Oz Harvest, I guess our core business is food rescue. So that is the collection of surplus food from food businesses. So food that would otherwise end up in landfill. Mm. And what we do is we redistribute that food out to lots of different charitable organisations in the community that can utilise that good food. It's a wonderful organisation. We've talked about it on, on the yeah, program before. But I wouldn't have sort of drawn the logical conclusion between it and carbon neutral. How does, sure. how does, how does your involvement come in yeah, with this plan? Yeah, sure. Well, look, when food breaks down in landfill, it creates a methane gas. And the methane gas is 25 times more har uh, harmful than, than carbon dioxide. Um, so for us, in terms of the impact of our organisation, it's measured on, on two fronts. One is the social impact and, and be able to deliver that food mm. out to the charitable organisations, but certainly the environmental impact in terms of the reduction of carbon emissions um, being safe from landfill is, is key for us. So really, it was probably a no-brainer for you to put, you, put up your hand and become a partner over this one. Absolute no-brainer, yeah. yeah. And to join together with organisations across different sectors, I think that's just such a strength, um, you know, not-for-profit organisations and corporate organisations that are all coming together with a common goal. Um, and I think being very proud of South Australia and, yeah. and Adelaide, um, as Julia mentioned, you know, we're, we're leaders typically in the waste space and uh, I'm very proud of that as well. Paul, come back to you uh, about uh, the advice that you give. Um, we, we talked about uh, new houses and so forth, but you mentioned in the city, particularly high density and, you know, the skyscrapers in which we, we all work in the city, that's a real issue, converting them. It, it is, yeah. I mean, in, in, uh, in, uh, in terms of priority order, I mean, uh, we as people are worried about our own homes, but as a city, it's really the, the growth of high density apartment towers, commercial buildings, you know, large scale infrastructure buildings like hospitals and everything mm. else that the city has yeah they, they are the, the 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 big issue and that's a much much bigger bigger nut to crack so uh, we we think we've cracked the apartment tower issue with our you know, zero carbon apartments design and that, that you know if you google that you'll you'll find some information about that but, yeah, but how do we go about converting the, the the buildings that already exist yeah so um i think it's a combination of things as you mentioned already alan you can look at general energy efficiency mm -hmm. the older building stock you can do simple things like you know lighting upgrades and air conditioning system upgrades looking at the facades making them more efficient so we can pull down the base load to as low a position as possible but it's still going to use energy so what then you've got to look at where the energy comes from you can look at some embedded energy systems so we've, we did a lot of work last year with pete souls on the use of biodiesel which is a zero carbon fuel or very close to zero carbon you could put a generator in the building that uses that fuel mm -hmm. It's pretty cost effective. Uh, it means detaching yourself a little bit from the grid, which brings in its own sort of uh, security of supply issues and what have you. Other than that, I think the, the, the biggest solution is really what state government is now focusing on now, which is trying to recapture ownership of where the electricity comes from in the state. So if, for example... Uh, we did nothing with the building stock and we did nothing about our energy efficiency. If all of the electricity that, we, that came into the grid was renewable, of course our buildings would have a zero carbon mm. footprint. Mm. So, you know, if, if, you could, if you could waste lots of renewable energy, would you still do it? You know, or would you, you know, so there's, 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 a, there's got to be, part of the solution has got to be looking at the grid, it's got to be looking at where the energy actually comes from because... As you mentioned, with the existing building stock, there's only so much you can do with efficiency. And, of course, the buildings, the building owners have got to pay for that. Uh, they're private individuals. They've got their own balance sheets to, to deal with. They may not have the capital available to to, to pay for that. And so there's a limit. Um, yeah, wh wh how do you fill the gap? So mm. I think infrastructure's got a big part to play. There. So, Julia, a big challenge? A big challenge. And um, what government has a role in doing is trying to provide the levers for property owners and building owners and, and tenants to come up with a solution to be able to access finance, um, to upgrade buildings, and then um, tenants being better off with having lower lower electricity bills, mm. but also a much better uh, 
much more pleasant sort of building to be in. And um, we've done this through what we called a building upgrade finance mechanism, which um, went through Parliament on the end of 2015 as well. And we're getting to the point where now um, we have councils who will sign up and they can provide um, the mechanism with property owners and financiers to access that money to be able to do those upgrades because um, getting the money has been a bit of a barrier, especially when um, the tenant might be the um, beneficiary of, of um, having lower electricity bills, but the property owner is sort of not getting any benefit from that. So this mechanism has basically sort of a win-win really for um, tenants and building owners and um, we're hopefully we're going to start seeing we're already starting to see sort of the property and the building stock within the city change and um, there's there's huge benefits with that and of course with the electricity I mean the, the South Australian government has really gone down the road of investing in renewable energy with its energy plan the solar thermal and the, and the biggest battery Tesla mm -hmm. battery mm -hmm. there's a whole raft of things that are quite exciting which which again South Australia is at the forefront of and of and um, leading the way it's interesting just in the la in the conversation the last 20 minutes it's clear that uh uh, we're a long way down this path than we probably most of us uh, think, which is um, a very uh, important point to make. And that leads us to uh, the um, the Carbon Neutral Adelaide Awards Program that people can get involved with. Yes. So this is a, a, a new awards program that we're hoping that people will... will get on board and, and become part of. And there's a whole raft of things. And the, the purpose of the awards program is to what you say, Alan, is to, to recognise what people are already mm. doing. Mm. And, um, it again, the environmental benefits and the business benefits are clear, but it's showcasing those um, partners and those buildings, owners and, and companies and organisations like D-Squared and OzHarvest and Uniting Communities to showcase what they're doing and for everyone to, to hear about and to encourage everyone else to be on board. So we have the first um, Carbon Awards program this year and um, there's... There's several categories that, that are around this year. So we've got um, Partner of the Year Award. So this will be the organisation or, or business or, or community organisation that has achieved the most significant carbon emissions. But it's not just about that. There's also about Leadership and Influence. So there's a Leadership and Influence Award. There's a Low Carbon Economy Award. So the most at, at outstanding example of an organisation which has embraced their transition um, there's an innovation award, so there might be some amazing innovation that's just beginning to take off and someone has applied it. Um, they might not have huge emissions reduction just yet, but the innovation is so significant that it's really worthy of, of being recognised. And then, then there's this um, award which is really for householders and, and mm -hmm. people in their homes, and we're calling it the New Normal Award, which is an unusual title, but it's about these households that are, are demonstrating their aspirations for reducing their emissions and, and their own footprint and really want to recognise those people too. So, yes, so All it's right. exciting. So for more details on that uh, area, go to Carbon Neutral Adelaide. That's all one word, carbonneutraladelaide.com.au and uh, just Google in there some awards and uh, you, you'll track the details from there. Absolutely. All right. Uh, interesting conversation. Uh, it, it's, it's very uh, encouraging to learn that... Uh, we're further down the path than uh, we probably thought 20 minutes ago. So thank, thanks for coming in. Uh, Julia Grant from the Department of uh, Environment and Natural Resources, Paul Davey from D-Squared, Sustainable Design uh, Organisation, and Hayley Everest from uh, Oz, Oz Harvest. Log thanks. on to that uh, website and uh, find some more details. Great. Thank okay, you very much. Thanks a lot. To stay with us after the break, uh, we'll uh, solve all of your IT issues because the man himself is here, Richard Pascoe.